we are going to talk about glycemic targets. So this is section six of your slides. All right, so A1C testing. How do we determine what their target number should be? So we want to perform the A1C test at least twice a year who are doing fine, who are meeting their goals and have stable blood sugars. These are the people that need to be bringing in or everybody should be bringing in their blood sugar monitor at every single visit. And either you can upload them to the computer or look through their meter or they should have it written down. I always like people writing it down because number one, it, number one, it puts it in the cognitive side of their brain, so they're more accountable to what they're seeing. And number two, it's easier to see a graph. Although there's a lot of phone apps now that are able to show a graph or like a bunch of readings at one time, so you can take a look at that. I do love the new apps that are out now. Otherwise, you want to do it quarterly if they're not meeting their goal. All right, so these are mean glucose levels for specific A1C levels. So if you see, for example, if they have between a 7.5 and 7.9 will come down here. And the, the mean fasting glucose is around 167. In other countries, they use millimoles, but in the United States, we use uh, milligrams per deciliter. We do things different, you know, in the United States with numbers. <laughs> Everyone else is on the metric system except for us, right? <laughs> All right, and then this is a pre-meal glucose, post-meal, and these are averages. If somebody comes back and has an A1C around 7.5 to 7.99, so you can help show the patient, you know, your A1C is this. Well, that tells me your blood sugar is up in the 170s most of the time. So a reasonable A1C goal for many non-pregnant adults is less than seven. That's an A recommendation. So remember, reasonable. So that is what I'm going to show you. How are we going to choose what their A1C goals is? We might, we might want to have them be less than 6.5. It just depends. And I'm going to show you the graph that will help you determine what your patient's A1C goal is going to be. I think it's nice that we do have more leeway to determine uh, ourselves what the A1C goal should be. I think it's really good for accountable care and quality of care. So these are a uh, summary. So the preprandial glucose is recommended 80 to 130 in an A1C of less than 7, and the peak postprandial less than 180. But again, this is uh, what a reasonable is, but it might not necessarily be what you want for your patient because someone who is at an A1C of 6.9, remember, still has diabetes. And so if they're younger and don't have any other major comorbidities that would interfere with bringing their A1C down, then you should have their target be lower because with uh, higher blood sugar means you're doing damage to your body. So it means complications. And less stringent A1C goals, such as less than eight, may be more appropriate also. So if you have an elderly person that uh, they're more at risk for hyper hypoglycemia, maybe you want them on the higher side. So this is an important a graph or a table, I should say, or whatever, picture. Uh, and I have this in the article that I'm going to post to you. And this is how you determine, help determine where this A1C should be. So if you see A1C 7.0, .7, less stringent, more stringent. So you go down the line. So what are the re risks associated with hypoglycemia? All right, let's say we have um, Mary, who's age um 85 okay so she's 85 years old and she's kind of frail uh, she's had diabetes for 30 years she has end-stage copd and high blood pressure and that goes with it high cholesterol that stuff so she's not on a statin because they took her off it because she's 85 and we need cholesterol for our brain so we took we took her off that she's on an ace inhibitor she's on a beta blocker uh, because you'll find most elderly are on beta blockers. Because <laughs> when I did nursing home rounds, I, it was like uh, candy, basically. 
uh, that people were on. And so her life expectancy having COPD is probably not too long. So when we say 10 years, that is what we kind of use as a guide. They have a 10 year life expectancy. All right. And we talked about her comorbidities. She has some more severe comorbidities, shorter life expectancy. She's had longstanding diabetes and um, she's elderly. So I'm thinking age. Um, vascular complications, not really sure. Patient preference. Um, I'd say it, her condition, if she has cognitive impairment, then it would probably be more here. But if someone that she's like, that's it, I want to make change, she's really, um, you know, cognitively with it, then, you know, that might be a little different, but you got all these other ones going against you. And then what are her support system and resources? I will say in the nursing home, they don't give them diabetic diets. I have not been to one nursing home, at least around where I live in Kenosha, that have diabetic diets for the patients. They're always chasing blood sugars. So yes, they have dietitians there and uh, resources, but it's not, to me, in my opinion, um, we have an understaffing problem and a funding problem. And so I don't blame it on the nurses. I don't blame it on the, that. It's a system issue why we don't have uh, exceptional care in nursing homes, which is sad. So this patient, I would probably have, or I would have her goal be eight. Uh, somebody who's kind of in the middle of these then say, well, yeah, we can do seven. Uh, because if they have a vascular complications, um, but they're newly diagnosed and they're obese, I'd say, you know what, let's get your blood sugar down. We don't want to further your complications. If we have a younger person, like say myself, as I'm saying, I'm younger, um, but I am under 50, so I'm in that in that age range. I am low on all of these, so I need to be at, um, below. I need to be below the borderline diabetes range. So in reality, yes, I don't want my blood sugar even in the borderline. So, but in practice, let's just set a goal of let's say uh, less than 6.5, that would be very reasonable. And depending on your patient preference, again, I'm very highly motivated and have, I think, good self-care capabilities. I'm getting lower than that. And I don't have hypoglycemia issues, but there are some people that do. So those that do, you have to figure out why are you having hypoglycemia? Make sure that they have something on them that they can have if they have, uh, low blood sugar symptoms. Glucose is the preferred treatment for the conscious individual. If it's less than 70, there are stages or different types or levels, level one, two, and three. So if it's less than 70 or level one, level two is less than 54, and level three is when you have an altered mental status and you need help. So glucagon should be prescribed for all individuals at risk of level two hypo glycemia um, and available as needed. Give it to their caregivers at school. So type one diabetics, particularly family members, and they need to know how to administer, to administer it. So it's not limited to just healthcare professionals. The lay people need to know how to use that too. And um, hypoglycemia unawareness or one or more episodes of level three hypoglycemia should trigger re reevaluation of the treatment. So why are they having these hypoglycemic reactions or not aware? Maybe they're on a beta blocker and beta blockers mask a hypoglycemia. And insulin treated patients with hypoglycemia unawareness or an episode of level two should be advised to raise their tar the glycemic targets. So that goes back to that a picture that I showed you. And I always have that um, with me. I have like a little book, which has all my diabetic stuff in there. I like pictures. So I have the pictures in there and my tables. All right. And I'm just going to talk a little bit about a diabetic technology real quickly. There's, because I know you guys know a lot about this. There's syringes and there's pens depends what the insurance com company covers. There's insulin pumps, mostly for type one diabetics. And um, it's a great option for under seven years of age. 
just because they're not able to really uh, understand and getting the shots. It's just easier for them. There's different types of blood glucose monitoring. So there's the intermittent where you just check when you're poking. Uh, and those that are on insulin need to check it uh, at least before every single meal, fasting and before bed, before exercise, after exercise. Those with type 2 and oral medication uh, should definitely be checking a fasting blood sugar. Uh, but if I find somebody that is more uh, willing and self-care, then I have them test it quite often because they need to change their lifestyle and they need to eat to their meter. They need to know what foods are bringing their blood sugar up so they know to stay away from those. So glucose meter accuracy, uh, there's always going to be some variances. It's about a 95% variance uh, versus the A1C with glucose meters. And uh, so if you just get the appropriate devices that are out there uh, by prescription and the ones that are from CVS, Walgreens, Walmart, those are pretty accurate too. Like I said, I have two meters. I have a really good one, um, a Relyon. Uh, no, yeah, the Relyon is a Walmart. And then I have an AccuCheck and they both are basically the same. There are some substances though that can interfere with it such as um, uric acid, galactose, xylose, Tylenol, which is acetaminophen, L-DOPA, uh, which would be for patients with Parkinson's and vitamin C, ascorbic acid. So just to keep that in mind, also uh, used in, um, in peritoneal dialysis, there can be a, an issue with that. So there's also the continuous blood glucose monitors and uh, those are attached to them continuously or there's the real-time one now which you um, can have it be 24 7 monitoring your glucose and then there's an intermittent scan glucose monitor and as well as the IV pumps which I talked about so I do want to show you really quick some of the and this is <laughs> this is the only way I can find it uh, there's the Freestyle Libre, and this goes on them, uh, on their upper arm, and it stays on them, I think, for three days. I'm not positive. I could be wrong on that. But anyways, all they have to do is they don't have to poke themselves anymore. They just scan this uh, close to their arm, and it'll read their, uh, so that's the intermittent blood glucose. Dario is very similar. Uh, that's the Dario and Dexcom is the continuous blood glucose monitoring if there's there might be other ones out there these are the ones that i am familiar with so uh just to let you know and that is it for this uh video